Short Lives of the Dominican Saints, Part 12 September 5th Blessed Catherine of Racconigi, Virgin, 1486-1547 Blessed Catherine was born at Racconigi in Piedmont in 1486. The place of her birth was an old half-ruined hut, exposed to all the inclemency of the weather, for her parents had been reduced to extreme poverty in consequence of the war raging between the Duke of Savoy and the Marquis of Saluzzo. The child had to suffer many hardships from her infancy, but she bore all with patience and even in those tender years was honored with many wonderful tokens of the divine favor. One day she broke a cup, which her mother greatly valued, and, as she was weeping inconsolably in expectation of being severely punished, a beautiful child suddenly appeared in the room, picked up the broken pieces, and restored the cup to her whole and entire and then vanished from her sight. At the age of five our blessed lady mystically espoused her to the infant Jesus, in presence of many angels and saints, and in particular Saint Jerome, Saint Peter Martyr, and Saint Catherine of Siena. On this occasion our Divine Lord gave these three saints to her as her special patrons and protectors, and also commanded a seraph to watch over her for the remainder of her life, in addition to the angel who had guarded her from birth. Her heavenly espousals to the beloved of her soul were renewed on two subsequent occasions with circumstances of great solemnity. When she was fourteen, as she was praying earnestly before daybreak on the feast of St. Stephen, and telling that glorious proto-martyr that the apostles had especially given women into his keeping, and that, therefore, she hoped he would take her under his protection and help her preserve her virginity, he appeared to her bidding her to be of good courage, for her prayer was heard, and she should presently be filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then three rays of light descended upon her, and she heard a voice saying, I am come to dwell in thee, and to purge, illuminate, enkindle, and animate thy soul. Nor was this the only time on which she visibly received the Holy Ghost. He had come upon her in the form of a dove when she was only five years old, and he came on two later occasions, once as a shining cloud, and again under the form of tongues of fire. One Christmas night, as she was meditating on the birth of the Divine Infant, the seraph, who had been given her as a guardian, transported her to Bethlehem, where she beheld the holy child in vision, and was permitted to take him into her arms and caress him. Several times her divine spouse took her heart out of her body to cleanse and beautify it, as he had done to her patroness, St. Catherine of Siena. Indeed, the tokens of divine favor granted to her bore a strong resemblance to those bestowed on the saint on the seraphic saint of Siena, and the whole character of the sanctity of both was, so to speak, cast in the same mold. Lights, like St. Catherine, she became a member of the Third Order of St. Dominic, still continued to live among seculars. Like her, too, she received the impression of the sacred stigmata, which, by her own request, were invisible to the eyes of others. 
she was permitted to share in the sufferings caused to her divine spouse by his crown of thorns, and she often received holy communion in a miraculous manner. And, like St. Thomas Aquinas, she was girded by the hands of angels. The words, Jesus my hope, were several times inscribed in letters of gold upon her heart. And all the while this wonderful life of visions and raptures were being lived, blessed Catherine's surroundings were those of a poor peasant woman, obliged to work hard to earn daily bread for herself and her family. She would sometimes feel tempted to repine at being thus continually kept at her weaving without a moment's respite, and once, when she was only nine years old, as she thought of the hunger and want her poor mother had to endure, she leaned her head on her loom and burst into tears, fervently commending the misery of her home to the providence of God. Then her divine spouse appeared to her under the form of a child as forlorn and destitute as herself, and asked an alms of her. She answered that, much as she would have desired to help him, she had not then a single thing on earth that she could bestow. Then the holy child made himself known to her, gave her a piece of money to provide food for the family, and encouraged her to bear poverty cheerfully after his example. As a true daughter of St. Dominic, Blessed Catherine was full of zeal for souls, and once besought her divine spouse to shut the mouth of hell. When told that her desire was an impossible one, she implored that he would exercise his justice on herself and have compassion on poor sinners. She was often taken in a miraculous manner to visit persons who lived at a great distance from her home, that she might warn them of the spiritual dangers which threatened them. By her prayers and penances she obtained the release of many souls from purgatory, and she was sometimes permitted to take their sufferings upon herself, and thus to hasten their admission to the joys of paradise. After a life of wonderful union with God and entire self-renunciation, she died, abandoned by her friends and deprived even of her confessor, on September 4, 1547, in her 62nd year. She was beatified by Pius VII. September 6th, Blessed Bertrand of Garigua, Confessor, 1230. Blessed Bertrand was a native of Garigua, a little place in the south of France, apparently a fief or farm belonging to the Cistercian Abbey of Our Lady at Bosquet. He was brought up by the nuns of that abbey and received an education which fitted him for holy orders. From his youth he had had sad and personal experiences of the terrible condition to which the ravages of the Albigensian heretics had reduced the fair provinces of southern France. In the year 1200, Raymond the Sixth, Count of Toulouse, had overrun the country at the head of an army of these miscreants, directing his attack chiefly on the monasteries and churches. Blessed Bertrand's kind benefactresses, the good nuns of Bosquet, had been obliged to seek refuge in flight, and their abbey might have been razed to the ground had not one of their vassals had the happy inspiration to overturn some beehives which stood on the walls, and the exasperated bees drove the enemy back in confusion. It was quite natural, therefore, that as soon as he was ordained priest, 
Blessed Bertrand should volunteer to join the mission then being conducted by the Cistercian monks to reclaim the people from the errors of the Albigenses, and thus became acquainted with our Holy Father, St. Dominic, who was then taking part in the same holy enterprise. From the first day that they met, a common sympathy in divine things knitted their hearts together. Thus the ancient chroniclers of the order speak of Blessed Bertrand as the beloved companion of Dominic, the dearest associate in all his labors, the sharer in his devotions, the imitator of his sanctity, and the inseparable companion of his journeys. By his watchings, his fasts, and his other penances he succeeded, says Bertrand Guidonis, in so perfectly imprinting on his own person the likeness of his beloved father, that one might have said, seeing him pass by, truly the disciple is like the master. There goes the very portrait of St. Dominic. After making his profession at Pruil, on the Feast of the Assumption, 1217, in the company of the other fifteen first commandions of the Holy Patriarch, Blessed Bertrand is one of those chosen to lay the foundations of the order in Paris. And two years later we find him again visiting that city, on his latter occasion as the companion of St. Dominic. The details of this journey Blessed Jordan learned from Blessed Bertrand's own lips. The two holy travelers, going from Toulouse by way of Rocamandor, spent the night devoutly in that celebrated sanctuary of Our Lady. The next day, as they traveled along, they overtook some German pilgrims who were miraculously enabled to understand their language. In an earlier journey made by Blessed Bertrand in the saint's company, they remained untouched by the torrents of rain which fell about them. It is related of Blessed Bertrand that he constantly wept for his sins, for which he was wont to do excessive penance. St. Dominic, however, reproved him, and enjoined him rather to weep and pray for the sins of others. And this charge had such an effect on the soul of Blessed Bertrand, that from that time, even if he wished, he was not able to weep for his own sins. But, when he mourned for those of others, his tears would flow in great abundance. He was accustomed every day to say Mass for sinners, and being asked by one brother Benedict, a prudent man, why he so rarely celebrated Mass for the dead and so frequently for sinners, he replied, We are certain of the salvation of the faithfully departed, whereas we remain tossed about in many perils. Then, said Brother Benedict, if there were two beggars, one with all his limbs sound and the other quite disabled, which would you compassionate the most? And he replied, The one certainly who can do least for himself. If so, said Brother Benedict, for certainty certainly are the dead, who have neither mouth to confess nor hands to work, but who ask our help, whereas living sinners have mouths and hands, and with them can take care of themselves. Blessed Bertrand, however, remained unconvinced. But the following night there appeared to him a terrible vision of a departed soul, who, with a bundle of wood, pressed and waited upon him after a strange fashion, and, waking him up more than ten times that same night, marvelously vexed and troubled him. Therefore the following morning he called Brother Benedict to him and told him all that befallen him in the night, and then religiously and with many tears going to the altar he offered the holy sacrifice for the departed, and from that time very frequently did the same. 
After filling the office of prior of St. Romain's at Toulouse, Blessed Bertrand was appointed the first provincial of Provence, which then included the whole of southern France. He devoted himself earnestly to the work of preaching up to the time of his death, which took place at the Abbey of Bosquet, about 1230. Twenty-three years afterwards his body was found whole and corrupt. The precious remains were sacrilegiously burnt by the Huguenots in the sixteenth century, but the, de but the devotion to him has subsisted even to our own day. He was beatified by Pope Leo XIII. September 15th, the commemoration of our Holy Father, St. Dominic, in Soriano, 1530. The event commemorated in this festival is the appearance in the Dominican convent of Soriano, in the extreme south of Italy, of a miraculous picture of St. Dominic, which is still preserved and is held in the utmost veneration even in our own day. A certain Father Vincent of Cantanzara in Calabria in the year 1510 was thrice commanded by St. Dominic in vision to found a convent of the order at Soriano, a work which he accomplished in spite of considerable obstacles which were not overcome without miraculous intervention. It had been decided that the convent should be built on the plain, but the cross which had been planted to mark the destined site was found to have been mysteriously removed in the night to the hill on which the building was eventually erected and where it still stands. Several years later, on September 15, 1530, just as the religious were assembling to chant mountains at midnight, the sacristan suddenly beheld three ladies of majestic aspect enter the church, which he knew he had left locked before retiring to rest. One of them addressed him, asking to whom the church was dedicated and whether it contained a picture of its patron. The friar replied that the church was dedicated to St. Dominic, but that, owing to the great poverty of the community, only a badly painted fresco of the saint was to be found upon its walls. Then the unknown lady put into his hands a roll of canvas, which till then she had carried in her hand, and bade him to take it to his superior, who bore the title of vicar, the little convent not having been erected into in the priory. The vicar, astonished at the sight of the picture which proved to be a portrait of St. Dominic, hastened to the church to thank the giver, but all three mysterious visitors had disappeared, though the outer doors still remained locked. The following night St. Catherine of Alexandria appeared to them, who had a great devotion to her, and told him, in answer to his prayers, that the donor of the picture was none other than the Blessed Virgin, and that the two who had accompanied her were the patronesses of the order, St. Mary Magdalene and herself. In obedience to the express command given by Our Lady to the sacristan, when bestowing the picture, it was placed over the high altar, but, as the wall against it, it hung was extremely damp, the fathers afterwards decided on removing it to another altar near the door of the church. The following morning, however, the picture was again found hanging over the high altar. The vicar, believing that it had been removed thither by the sacristan from a desire to execute to the letter the orders given him by the Mother of God, severely reproved him, 
and had the picture carried back to the agreed-upon altar. The next day it once more appeared over the high altar. Again the sacristan was charged with obstinacy and disobedience. In vain he protested that he had never touched the picture. The vicar ordered it to be placed, replaced near the door, and on the following night locked the church himself and kept the keys in his own possession. Nevertheless, on the third morning it was again discovered over the high altar. Convinced at length that its removal was the work of no human hand, the vicar allowed it to remain in the spot which Our Lady had chosen for it, and where it has ever since remained, miraculously preserved from being injured by the damp. When the picture was exposed to public veneration, a multitude of prodigies took place, the account of which fills volumes. No less than sixteen hundred of these miracles, juridically attested, took place within the space of seventy-eight years. Pope Innocent the Twelfth, in the year 1644, granted a festival in commemoration of this event and of the vast number of miracles vouchsafed before the holy picture. On September 15, 1870, just five days before the sacrilegious occupation of Rome by the troops of Victor Emmanuel, a new prodigy took place at Soriano. A wooden statue of our Holy Father, St. Dominic, of life size, had been exposed in the sanctuary on occasion of the festival, and it was to be carried in procession of the, in the evening. The statue was suddenly seen to move like a preacher in the pulpit. It advanced and drew back. The right arm rose and fell. The countenance became animated, sometimes assuming a severe and threatening aspect, at other times appearing sad or again full of sweetness and reverence as it had turned towards the picture of Our Lady of the Rosary. This extraordinary spectacle lasted for an hour and a half and was witnessed by two thousand persons. Some of the bystanders, to satisfy themselves that there was no trickery in the matter, removed all the surroundings of the statue and completely stripped the table on which it was standing the measures only served to place the miraculous nature of the occurrence beyond the possibility of a doubt. A juridical inquiry was held by the order of the Bishop of Mileto, in whose diocese Serrano is situated, and extraordinary event was announced to the order in a circular letter by the Most Reverend Father Alexander Vincent Chandel, who was then general. In a private letter written by his paternity, shortly afterwards he says, I think our Holy Father St. Dominic meant to warn us of the impending scourges, and to summon us to do penance, but this warning is in itself an act of mercy on the part of him who strikes only to heal. September 16th Blessed Imelda Lambertini, Virgin, Patroness of First Communicants, 1322-1333 Blessed Imelda was born at Bologna in Italy about 1322, of the family of the Lambertini, distinguished alike for nobility and piety. Her father was a rich, brave, and powerful nobleman who filled several important posts and was remarkable for his charity to the poor, especially to the mendicant religious orders. His wife, Castora, was worthy of him. She had a particular devotion to pray for the souls in purgatory, and for their relief she multiplied her charitable donations to monasteries and churches. 
Like the child Jesus, Imelda grew in wisdom, age, and grace with God and men. From her earliest years she took little interest in the ordinary amusements of her age, but lis listened eagerly to holy stories and religious instruction, and gave herself entirely to a life of devotion. She made a little oratory for herself, wherein she delighted in reciting the psalms and other prayers. When Imelda had entered on her tenth year, she was placed in the Dominican convent of St. Mary Magdalene, situated at the Val de Pietra, at the foot of the hills which lie to the south of Bologna. The laws of the church, which now regulate the age for admission to the novitiate, had not been then enacted. It may well have been, therefore, that little Imelda actually embraced the religious life at this early age. And this is the view of the case usually taken by the writers of her story. It is possible, however, that her pious parents, as is still sometimes done in Catholic countries, had only vowed her to God and St. Dominic, to wear the habit for a certain number of years. Amelda was, at this time, we are told, remarkably tall for her age, fragile and delicate, and fair as an angel to behold. The young saint threw herself heart and soul into the new life which had opened before her. This child of nine years old set herself to practice the austere rule with the most loving fidelity, devoting herself to the exercise of prayer and penance, and by her fervor rendering herself a model even to the oldest and most saintly of the community. She erected a little calvary in the most remote part of the garden, and thither she loved to retire, in order to meditate undisturbed on the sufferings and death of her divine spouse. But her chief devotion was to Jesus, hidden in the sacrament of his love, and with all the ardor of her soul she did long for the happy day when our Lord would unite her to himself and in holy communion. Tell me, she would often say to her religious sisters, how is it possible to receive Jesus into one's heart and not to die? It appears that it was not then usual in northern Italy for children to make their first communion before the age of fourteen. Vainly, therefore, did the little Imelda over and over again beseech her confessor to allow her to approach the holy table. He turned a deaf ear to all her entreaties. But he, who feeds amongst the lilies, and who, when he was on earth, said, Suffer little children to come to me, and forbid them not, would not allow the loving young heart to be disappointed. It was the last of the Rogation days, May 12, 1333. The two years in which she had now spent in the religious life and the approach of the great festival of the Ascension had caused the flames of divine love to burn more brightly than ever in the breast of Imelda. All the nuns approached the holy table. She alone knelt apart in the corner of the choir, pouring forth her acts of fervent desire, and weeping bitterly because she was not allowed to share their happiness. The mass was over, the priest had left the altar, the lights were extinguished, the community had for the most part dispersed to dis discharge their various domestic duties, Still Imelda knelt on, absorbed in prayer. Suddenly a heavy fragrance filled the sacred building and diffused itself even beyond its precincts. It drew the sisters back to the choir, where a wondrous sight met their eyes. A radiant host was suspended in the air above the head of the saintly child. Her heavenly bridegroom had heard her prayer and was indeed come to make her all his own. 
the astonished nuns immediately summoned the chaplain to the spot. He came in his sacred vestments, with a paten in his hand, knelt in wondering adoration, awaiting some further manifestation of the divine will. Then the host gently descended upon the paten, and the priest communicated Melda. The transport of love and joy and gratitude was too great for the weak bodily frame. The happy child closed her eyes and, in the kiss of the Lord, breathed forth her pure soul to go and make endless thanksgiving in heaven. Her holy remains now lie in the little church of St. Sigismund at Bologna. She was beatified by Leo XII in 1826, and is deservedly regarded as the patroness of first communicants. Confraternities in her honor have been established in several places, the English confraternity having its center at St. Dominic's Priory, Haverstock Hill, London. September 20th Blessed Francis Posadas Confessor 1643-1713 Blessed Francis Posadas was born about 1643 in Cordova, in Spain, of a family which had fallen from its ancient position of nobility into a state of poverty. Whilst still an infant, the name of Mary was found miraculously imprinted over his heart, and it was the first that his baby lips were heard to utter. From his earliest years he gave evidence of the tenderest piety. He daily recited the rosary and practiced other exercises of devotion while still a child. His mother, who was a very pious woman, seeing his great attraction to religion, wished him to enter the order of St. Dominic, and had him educated with that view but after his father's death she married again, and Francis was cruelly treated by his stepfather, who insisted on his giving up his studies and being put to learn some useful trade. This was accordingly done, but the pious youth never abandoned his holy purpose, and by his unfailing obedience and sweetness of temper so won his master's favor as to obtain his leave to continue his studies. He was at last allowed to enter the novitiate in the Dominican convent of Scala Celi. But, as a further trial of his constancy, God permitted that his true worth and character should not be at first appreciated by his brethren and, sister and superiors. He was treated with contempt and harshness all of which he endured with unalterable patience, until at length justice was done him, and a community recognized his sanctity and full of admiration at the wonderful patience with which he had borne their unkindness, unanimously consented to his being admitted to the priesthood. Blessed Francis led a life of prayer and penance, joined to marvelous activity in laboring for the salvation of souls. He set before himself as his model for imitation the glorious St. Vincent Ferrer, whom he chose as his special patron. The success which attended his preaching was scarcely less wonderful than that which resulted from the apostolic ministry of St. Vincent. His example, even more than his inflamed discourses, produced so extraordinary an effect on the hearts of his hearers that he obtained almost boundless influence over them. In his native city of Cordova, he set himself, and that of it with his marvelous success, to the difficult task of reforming the public morals, which were in a state of lamentable corruption. By the power of his preaching, 
the citizens were at length induced to close all the theatres and places of public amusement, which had formerly been scenes of immorality and disorder. His chief delight was to minister to the poor, the sick, and the imprisoned, providing for their bodily as well as their spiritual needs. Very often he was known to continue from sunrise to sunset instructing the poor and ignorant in the mysteries of the faith. He refused all positions of authority in the order, and could not be induced to accept two bishopics which were offered to him at different times. So profound was his humility that he not only exercised the lowliest offices in the house, but even rejoiced in being despised, calumniated, and insulted. He had to undergo terrible conflicts with the devil, from all of which he came forth victorious. He was endowed with the gifts of prophecy, discernment of spirits, and other supernatural favors. At length, having exercised the duties of a confessor and preacher for about forty years, he calmly slept in the Lord on the 20th of September, 1713. His heroic virtues having been confirmed by miracles, he was beatified by Pius the Seventh. September 26 Blessed Dalmatius Moner, Confessor 1291-1341 Blessed Dalmatius Moner was born of pious and respectable parents in the small town of Catalonia at about 1291. From childhood he was distinguished for innocence and piety. He received a good education at Girona, which was completed at the University of Montpellier, Entering the Dominican order at the age of twenty-five, he made it his lifelong study perfectly to conform his conduct to the requirements of the rules and constitutions. He was employed for many years in teaching, but at length humbly resigned his office from a desire to devote himself more closely to the service of God. Blessed Dalmatius led, led a life of extreme penance and mortification. He seldom ate anything but herbs and vegetables, almost raw, and in the burning heat of a Spanish summer would entirely abstain from drinking for as many as twenty consecutive days. His scanty rest was taken on the bare ground, he afflicted his bodies with continual fasts, disciplines, and other austerities, and devoted himself day and night to the exercises of prayer and contemplation. He loved to pray in solitary places, in the open air, the sights and sounds of nature helping to raise his mind and heart to God. One day, when he had been thus satisfying his devotion in a secluded valley, one of his brethren went in search of him, but could find him nowhere, until chancing to raise his eyes, he beheld the object of his search raised in ecstasy on a level with the top of a lofty tree which grew on the brow of an adjacent hill. Nor was it an unusual sight to see him thus suspended in the air. Blessed Dalmatius practiced the most rigid poverty, never taking with himself any provisions when on a journey, and even refusing the alms which were offered him. He preferred to put his whole trust in God, who often sent him help in his necessities by the ministry of angels. Every night when he chanted the Benedicti at Louds, these celestial spirits came and sang it with him, and so familiar was his intercourse with them 
that he was commonly known by the name of the friar who converses with the angels. To conceal his devotional exercises from the eyes of others, he used to retire by day to a cave which he had found in the neighboring hills, and at night he would hide himself in some secret part of the church. His love of retirement, and the great devotion which he bore to St. Mary Magdalene, introduced him to apply for permission to go and end his days at La Sainte Baume in Provence, which for thirty years had been the scene of the prayers, austerities, and raptures of that holy penitent, and which, then, as now, was served by the sons of St. Dominic. The desired leave was granted, and blessed Dalmatius visited the hollow spot with unspeakable devotion. But it was not God's will that he should take up his abode there, and he accordingly returned to Girona. Here he hollowed out a cave for himself, apparently in the convent gardens, and there lived for four years, never leaving it save when the bell summoned him to acquire a refractory with the other brethren. This penitential abode was dripping with wet, and the resort of serpents, but to him it was indeed the gate of heaven. The miracles of blessed Dalmatius were very numerous and striking, and he gained many signal victories over the powers of darkness. He died in his beloved cave, whilst in the act of raising his clasped hands to heaven, on the 24th of September, 1341. After his death, his countenance, which in life had been very dark and disfigured by his excessive penances, became wonderfully fair and beautiful. He then believed to have preserved his baptismal innocence unsullied throughout his whole life. Blessed Dalmatius especially invoked for the relief from toothache, and it is a frequent custom to dedicate infants to him by vow when they are cutting their teeth, in consequence of the many miracles worked by means of one of his teeth, which is preserved in a silver reliquary at the sacristy of Girona. He was beatified by Benedict the Thirteenth. Rosary Sunday, the first Sunday in October. The devotion of the Holy Rosary is the great treasure bequeathed by our fo Holy Father, St. Dominic, to his order and to the Church. A certain obscurity hangs over its origin, but a widespread tradition asserts that it was revealed to the Holy Patriarch by our Blessed Lady herself during his labors in Languedoc for the conversion of the Albigensian heretics, and that by preaching his devotion he gathered an immense harvest of souls. Pope Clement VIII declares that St. Dominic first established the confraternity of the Holy Rosary in the Church of St. Sixtus in Rome, and he is known to have established it also at Palencia in Spain. There can be no doubt that the use of the Hail Mary as a popular devotion dates from the beginning of the 13th century. Though it is impossible to determine whether the preaching of the rosary spread the more universal use of the angelic salutation, or whether it was the increasing love and popularity of that prayer which moved the holy patriarch to adopt it. During the fifteenth century, however, which was a period of general religious declension, the Roses of Mary, as they had been properly called, fell into partial oblivion and neglect, until, towards the close of the century, they were revived by the preaching of the celebrated Dominican, Blessed Alan de la Roque, 
a Brayton by birth. It is interesting to be able to record that in England at least the rosary never fell into disuse, but enjoyed undiminished popularity through the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, and that Henry the Sixth prescribed that the scholars of Eton College, founded by him in the year 1440, should daily recite the complete Psalter of the Blessed Virgin, consisting of a credo, fifteen potters, a hundred and fifty Ave Marias. This, it is, of course, beyond question that the children of St. Patrick, ever devout to our Blessed Lady, were ever faithful to the devotion of the Rosary, and that in the evil days as they would have given their lives than deny God and his Holy Mother, so they would rather have shed their blood than part with their beads. The solemnity which we celebrate on the first Sunday of October was established in thanksgiving for the great naval victory gained by the Christians over the Turks at Lepanto on Sunday, October 7th, 1571. On that memorable day, all the confernities of the Rosary in Rome had assembled in the Dominican Church of the Minerva to offer their devotions for a blessing on the Christian arms through the intercession of Mary. The Pope, St. Pius V, himself a friar preacher, had attended the procession and, on his return to the Vatican, God was pleased to reveal to him that the Queen of the Holy Rosary had even in that hour obtained a glorious victory for the Christian fleet. In testimony of his gratitude, the Holy Pontiff decreed that the 7th of October should henceforth be kept as the Feast of Our Lady of Victories. But Gregory the Thirteenth, admiring admiring the modesty of his predecessor, who had not chosen to make mention of the rosary, for fear he should be deemed to have sought to promote the honor of his order rather than spread of truth, ordained that in the future the feast of Our Lady of Victories should be kept on the first Sunday in October in all Dominican churches, and wherever the confraternity of the rosary existed, under the new title of the Festival of the Most Holy Rosary, which until that time had been on March 25th, the Festival of the Annunciation. This was finally extended to the Universal Church by Clement the Twelfth, who changed the wording of the Roman Martyrology to its present form, the commemoration of the Holy Mary of Victory, which Pope Pius V ordained to be observed every year, in memory of a famous victory gained at sea on this day by the Christians over the Turks, and through the help of the Mother of God. And Gregory the Thirteenth, for the same reason, likewise ordained that the annual solemnity of the Rosary of the same Most Blessed Virgin should be kept on the first Sunday of this month. In our own day, the devotion of the Holy Rosary has received a fresh impulse from the encyclical letters published year after year by our Holy Father, Leo the Thirteenth, whom we may call the Pope of the Rosary, who was constantly urged on the faithful to use the use of this salutary devotion, both as an excellent means of personal sanctification, an efficacious form of intercessory prayer, and a powerful weapon against the enemies of the Church. His Holiness had likewise extended to the Universal Church the practice, hitherto confined to the Dominican Order, of consecrating the whole month of October in a special manner to Our Lady of the Rosary. October 3rd 
Blessed John Masias, lay brother, confessor, 1585 to 1645. Blessed John Masias was a Spaniard of noble descent and born at Rivera in Castillo in 1585. His parents were very poor in the world's goods, but rich in virtue, and brought the child up very piously. When four years old, little John's mind seemed already to have attained the maturity of manhood. He cared nothing for childish sports and pastimes, but, consecrating him wholly to Our Lady, resolved to recite her rosary thrice every day, a practice in which he preserved even until death, to the great profit of his soul. He loved to gather children of his own age around him and instruct them in holy things. He lost his parents while still very young, and had to earn his bread as a shepherd. Whilst tending his flock, he devoted himself to prayer and holy meditation, and received many wonderful supernatural favors. God entrusted him in a special manner to the keeping of St. John the Evangelist, who often used to appear to him under the form of a beautiful child. Our Lady also frequently visited him, and these two celestial friends would sometimes carry him away with them to a glorious country, which, they told him, was the home in which they dwelt, and which he was one day to inhabit with them. When, after these mysterious journeys, he returned to the hills where he had left his flock, he found it safely tended, having been guarded all the time by a beautiful lady, doubtless no other than the Blessed Virgin herself. St. John also rendered him this charitable service during his ecstasies, collected his sheep for him, and helped him to bring them back to the fold at night. In obedience to the holy evangelist, he crossed over to South America, not, unlike so many of his countrymen, for the sake of gain, but because he had been told that somewhere in that distant land there was the place where God willed that he should serve him. On reaching the New World, John entered the service of a wealthy man, who was employed for two years and a half in tending cattle in the vast solitudes of those unexplored regions. At length his vocation was made manifest, and he became a lay brother in the Dominican convent of St. Mary Magdalene at Lima, a house of strict observance, where he made his profession on January 22, 1623. He treated his body with such extreme severity that his superiors were compelled to moder moderate his penitential practices. He allowed himself only one hour for sleep, and this he took kneeling in his cell before a picture of Our Lady, with his head leaning on the bed, or at the foot of the high altar, or rosary altar, or on the bare ground of the cloister. His food was very scanty and he used to collect all that was left from the meals of the community and distribute it on his knees to the poor with the most tender charity and devotion. His office of porter afforded him many opportunities of serving these suffering members of the Divine Master. He often begged for them in the city and trained the convent to go alone from house to house to gather alms for them. He fed two hundred poor persons, and the wooden spoon is still preserved with which he distributed the food at the convent gate, and with which, when his provisions were exhausted, he used to make the sign of the cross over the empty bowl, whereupon it would immediately be once more filled. He took special care of the bashful poor, and his miracles in the exercise of his charity were very numerous. The sanctity of Blessed John caused him to be held in very great esteem, 
so that persons of the highest rank used to come to the convent to see him and commend themselves to his prayers. This was a severe trial to his humility, and on such occasions he generally managed to hide from his illustrious visitors. He sincerely regarded himself as the worst of sinners. When his terrific austerities had caused a malady which necessitated his undergoing an extremely painful surgical operation, he bore the long and agonizing incisions without a groan, and when asked how he could remain so motionless beneath the knife, he humbly replied, I thought I was before the judgment seat of God, and that these torments were inflicted for my sins, and they seem little in comparison with what I deserved. Blessed John's devotion to the Blessed Sacrament was very great. He used to serve all the early Masses until the business of the day summoned him from the church, and then he would assist in spirit at the remaining Masses, kneeling in adoration as he caught the distant sound of the elevation bell. It was his great delight to decorate the church for the great festivals, especially to adorn the line of procession along which the Most Holy was to be borne on Corpus Christi. In spite of his continual occupations, he daily recited three rosaries on his knees. For fourteen years he was cruelly tormented by devils, as soon as he set himself to prayer, but he persevered faithfully and fervently in this holy exercise, in spite of all their efforts to drive him from it. He had a very special love for the crucifix which hung in the porter's room. His deathbed was a holy and happy scene. The Divine Master whom he had served so lovingly, Our Lady of the Rosary, the Beloved Disciple, and many other saints appeared to him and consoled him, and with the words, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, he tranquilly expired on the 17th of September, 1645. His miracles both in life and after death were very numerous and remarkable. He was beatified by Gregory the Sixteenth. <laughs>